Hello everybody and today we're going to be looking at the lecture in terms of mental health and exercise. Um, we've previously looked at concepts around exercise psychology and models and theories based off that, both theoretical frameworks and models of principles along with integrative approaches in relation to exercise adherence, exercise addiction, motivation to exercise, goal attainment and goal directed behaviour. And today we're going to be looking at the relationship between mental health and exercise. We'll also be classifying and doing a specific case study based off on some of the concepts based around mental health and depression. So to begin, what we're going to look at here today is the aims of the session. Okay, so we're going to look at what is the brain and what is the mind. We're going to look at what is mental health, what is stress, two sides to every story. Adding it all up, the stress equation, when do we see stress, the alarm reaction, stress leading to anxiety and depression, and then exercise solution and cure. So in terms of needing your help here, I just want everybody to take a moment to try and answer what they believe is mental health. What is mental health? We've got different classifications, <clears throat> ideas, concepts, beliefs, systems, attitudes, both conscious and unconscious biases towards things. So take a moment now to answer the question, what is mental health? Okay, so within mental health, we come across different things, associations, beliefs, systems, etc. And we can deal with a number of the different words that are on your screen now. We deal with the concepts around the psychological aspects, the physiological aspects, sensory, emotions, central nervous system, health problems, stimulus, brain response, coping mechanisms, etc. So on and so forth. We have the dopamine system in relation to drugs and depressive disorders that occur within the drug systems and medicinal uses then going forward. So mental health then describes how we think and feel about ourselves and others and how we interpret events in everyday life. It also relates to our ability to cope with change, transition, significant life events and the stress that often comes our way. Can we see the similarities of this application in sport and exercise settings? So we'll often try to create systems to cope with issues. We'll often see athletes, we'll often see coaches who will have situations in their daily lives and they take major preference and come into the training sessions that then occur after it. We all have setbacks, that's what we call life. So it's about normalizing these feelings, it's about normalizing these issues, concerns, worries, events that we have. And it's also about being able to realize that it's okay not to be okay. Um, and sometimes, you know, being aware that that doesn't have to last, but also being aware the flip of that is that if people are in moments or have had a little bit longer periods of um, downward mood, um, low mood, uh, and then issues around that, well then what we see there is that that's also fine and these things are normal that happen to people uh, worldwide. The World Health Organization tells us that mental health refers to the emotional resilience to be able to enjoy life and to survive pain, disappointment and sadness and the level of belief in your own and others dignity and worth. Interesting the last part of that, again what I would often ask uh, students to do, athletes, coaches, people to do is question what they see and maybe question the ability or the question of why dignity and worth is in there. So the wheel or the spectrum of mental health that we often see or speak of, uh, you've got my mental health, learning about mental health, understanding what mental health is, developing skills for mental health and then maintaining mental health. So the American Psychological Association would often refer to this learning spectrum in terms of mental health. So how does this occur for people or clients or participants or students, whoever it may be? Uh, you start off with a concept around your mental health and that might be an academic reference or it might just be a feeling or interpretation you have. Then generally what happens as we grow older, we start to learn about concepts again, citing back. It could be something in terms of a memory that you have, a previous memory or um, life event that's brought in or questions your ment your learning about mental health. Understanding mental health is a little bit different then. It's attached with feelings, generally emotives. Um, and then what's that doing for effective behavior then? So you will often refer to psychology. Um, and if you look at some of the pre-existing uh, information from 60s, 70s, 80s onwards, one of the major ones from uh, the USA literature would have been the ability to 
predict or control behavior or control and predict behavior now at a governance leveling that makes sense that obviously without a law or lawful setting you wouldn't be able to control society let alone your own feelings thoughts and emotions four is development skills for mental health so how do you develop these skills um again i'd often refer to this uh, i was at a national governing body um conference and one of the the participants who was speaking at this said event uh, mentioned that anxiety and stress aren't things that children deal with and that was just completely hokum preposterous to even claim that in fact young people have these concerns worries anxieties um and these depressive bouts but they don't have strategy skills or coping mechanisms to deal with it if you or i have a bad day well i know that going for a walk that evening with my wife and, the, and my dog per se could cheer me up in terms of my mood i get to express myself and communicate this to my my loved ones and this can then help so i built over a career over a lifespan like most people will build coping mechanisms and of course they can be both negative and positive uh, association attachments to alcohol or drug misuse often comes when they're accompanied as coping strategies for uh, life situations or our lifespan five then maintaining mental health knowing what is good for a mental health so obviously decreasing alcohol intake has been shown as a positive correlate with mood over people who have uh, decreased the alcohol intake that they have um, and obviously an increase in physical activity has also been shown to have a positive correlation to um maintaining our mental health also so we have a number of physiological components there obviously exercise is important in a number of different ways and um, the release of endorphins into the systems but again the release of endorphins into the system and something specific that we may have spoke about in the past would be the runner's high so the runner's high is a little bit different biochemically in terms of what we look at um, and and particularly in relation to um what's actually being released into the system yes endorphins are fantastic but the molecules in terms of the chemistry chemistry breakdown of them are too large so what we tend to find with a runner's high is these tiny endocannabinoids that attach onto opiate receptors that we have and they can then break the blood brain barrier and that will then give us this euphoric feeling or high the health uh, health psychology then when we look at health psychology you can imagine that you have different components so you've got your physical health the way you look feel uh, have you any you know pre-existing injuries per se your health physically uh, plays a major role your social health then who are you interacting with what is your social circle what's your social support network and then along with that is the emotional health then so how do we deal with things emotionally or do we just repress it repress these feelings so if you think about it the likes of a sigma freud um would often talk about the components of repression and the facts or the yields that comes with depression then again and how it can affect people so it's a major construct to be aware of the emotional health for people particularly um in times gone by it was very much a male standardization response to say stuff you know stiff up our lip um you know males don't talk about how they're feeling or stuff and situations like that where they're you know predisposed to that concept or ideal of the alpha male let's say but really the house can only be stable if it has a strong foundation and most if not all people's health is based off their mental health so how they're feeling um on a day-to-day -day basis and if we don't have that component of mental health then you'll see what happens is that they all tend to fall down your emotional health will be difficult to deal with your social health will probably become and deteriorate you will probably not want to interact um the way you would have previously whether that's with friends or that's with family or whether it's with somebody else that's all kind of part of the social health phenomena and then obviously our physical health you can imagine somebody who's suffering with poor mental health uh, they might not be sleeping so therefore it's decreasing our energy levels so we can only take energy in two ways the food which we uh, ingest and then the um sleep that we get in terms of sleep theories and backgrounds of restorative theory um and obviously if you're looking at your physical health then again uh, lots of people who suffer with stress and anxiety find it difficult in times to eat um healthily and take on good sources of of food um in situations like that they may eat infrequently and then of course obviously some people overeat then as well high fatty content foods then again
um which are you know dense in calories then so what is stress uh, it's something that's kind of stood to me since studying initially you know with stress we have these concepts based around it intuitively we know what it is um however defining what is meant by stress is no easy task the definition of stress therefore must include the interaction between external stress stressors and our physiological and psychological responses to them stress is classified as a constraining but remember this and this is what often goes astray propelling force that can cause the perceived effect of danger to an organism so danger can be classified in many different ways and danger doesn't mean that you're coming to a roundabout and if you don't turn when you do you're going to end up in a highly horrific car crash per se uh, danger is how we perceive it so for some people being in social settings can 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 be can perceived as dangerous to them um, and when that occurs then we've got a number of physiological responses so stress or anxiety stress generally has got that positive um uh, connotation that can be used within it as we've said before um an element of stress like you stress is seen as a euphoric type of stress um and although they are interchangeable there's you know there's a strong overlap the physical sensations of anxiety and stress may be very similar the cause of stress and anxiety are usually different stress focus mainly on external pressures on us that we're finding hard to cope with when we are stressed we usually know what we're stressed about and the symptoms of stress typically disappear after the stressful situation is over again i like to obviously add in the word typical there because i do believe in the power of the subconscious there you might be getting close to a date where you've had a negative experience and all of a sudden you may not consciously be thinking of said event but you could feel that your system is slightly off anxiety on the other hand isn't always an easy to figure out anxiety focuses on worries or fears about things that could threaten us so again you look at a threat to a system or an organism and that will give us a good insight into the physiological components of anxiety as opposed to stress some of them physiological components we would refer to in psychology as somatic signs of anxiety things like um, heart palpitations increased heart rates sweaty palms muscular fatigue muscular tension um, agitation or irritation and the list goes on and on um, in, in terms of stress as or in terms of anxiety from a somatic level two sides to the story as i said some research tells us that stress is healthy and necessary to keep us alert and adequate definition must also take into account the fact the fact that stress can be beneficial as well as detrimental and when we do look at that although the the the, the, the reference is quite dated it quite it's quite interesting and what we, we refer to as this beneficial type of stress is our physiological arousal levels to be able to complete tasks so we have to be aroused enough that we've put energy effort and concentration into things and if we do that then chances are that we'll be able to attain or ascertain closely the links and goals slash objectives that we wish to achieve so trying to add it all up then so trying to add the whole thing up then when we look at it the stress equation McKeown then looks at the neuro uh, neurobiological and systematic effects of chronic stress we've got the person and if you divide the person into the psychological so mentally and the physiological physically and then we add to that the environment that we place them in excuse me we add them to the environment we place in then we will get a greater idea of where we're going in terms of dealing with the amount of stress a person has as we're aware fully of it although there's been you know a lot of um variables and research to debunk what occurred within the stanford prison experiment or in abu Ghraib in in 20 2004 excuse me what we do find is that there have been institutional environments in the past that have illustrated the power of the environment and none other than the occurrence of what happened in the world war ii and um, after the second world war um Adolf Ickman and his henchmen for want of a better phrase uh you know were at the Nuremberg trial and professed to say that they were only following orders um, and that was the environment that they were placed in that created or allowed for them to perform these mass 
acts of genocide towards the, the Jewish people and, and others then as well. So the person devoid by the psycho psychological and physiological and add to the environment and that gives us the stress levels. So when do we stress, see stress? So students life isn't all that's made out to be at times. The perception of attending class each day can hardly be considered stressful. Hence the tone of our sarcasm there. Stress and student life tends to be highly um, correlated. People have the idea of students, you know, going out all night, drinking all day, blah, 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 you know. Um, and it's not always the way it is. There's a, a number of attachments that are associative to stress that come from college or come from school or whatever it is you have to remember that as soon as we know we're being evaluated we already have a thing called test anxiety so when we're in a situation where we can be evaluated already our arousal levels go up and when they do that can lead to us obviously being in a situation where and when we get to a situation of feeling like it's all too much or i can't go on with this so things like assessments and examinations coupled with the idea of meeting deadlines can cause a lot of types of stress and uh, once we feel that we're under that under threat it becomes biological and once it becomes biological we go back into the alarm reaction you know um you often see this mis kind of diagnosed as the alarm clock reaction but it's actually the alarm reaction so when we see the alarm reaction uh, historically people would have thought you know you either stay and fight but obviously in recent times and research uh, strong research correlates that's coming from belgium uh, recently um have told us that the third concept is i'm hoping that my students have all showered at the screen freeze so again as i said research around this idea of freezing in these highly stressful alarm reaction situations is not a new one in fact as i said pri prior to this a lot of research around people who are in these highly stressful situations including um rape victims uh, will often speak about being in a cat almost a catatonic state where they cannot move uh, they are conscious they can hear they can see and um, but they're almost in this freeze like state and this occurs with people as well in situations where they get really bad news you know family member passing away or a car crash or something like that where they they're almost in this freeze reaction as such and it is a reaction although it may be considered an inaction and um, in some cases we can say <clears throat> we can stay and fight uh, that's fine you know if you can and you're equipped with that great and then obviously some people will just fly and just get out of there and you know this is when we see people leaving courses etc so what happens when we fight flight or freeze so cortisol levels then tend to be uh increased and um, if then they stay increased so usually what tends to happen is we stay in fight and it can generally just re return to a normal level but if that doesn't happen then okay if it doesn't if we don't escape or we don't fight and are successful or we freeze and are still in that situation then um, you would hope then after that period of time that you will have a decrease in this cortisol level if that doesn't occur that cortisol level will increase as i've suggested now we see this quite often in our modern day lives and obviously our lives within a pandemic would certainly illustrate this and bring us closer to people who tend to be working morning noon and night and you can imagine when you've got to meet a deadline that that level of cortisol is visceral to us and keeps us awake and if that's switched on for a larger longer period of time excuse me uh, that can lead to uh, a series of detrimental effects to our health including increased in coronary heart disease increased in diabetes or uh, obesity then again okay so stress leading to physical anxiety uh, clenched jaw headaches mus uh, muscle tension as i said sweat and shivering dry mouth aggressive or passive posture urination so again you know concept based off um evolutionary psychology you know we we can urinate when we're we're agitated or irritated or anxious um and again it's to to feel lighter than to be able to fly if we do and um, the, the the one there that's you know uh, you know you gotta learn to you know with the butterflies in the stomach um 
it mightn't be about getting rid of the butterflies in the stomach but instead making them fly in formation and that's really the challenge that these arousal levels are good how do we frame it how do we positively frame it okay i wake up the morning of the day of a game and i've got this feeling in my stomach but it's i'm really anxious because of it no hang on a moment that's the body that's the mind that's the physiology this is what the philosopher socrates play or aristotle would all have suggested it's the body's physiological response preparing us for action the body's physiological response preparing us for action what a nice way to think about it long term issues with stress and anxiety so cardiovascular disease coronary heart disease heart attack hypertension angina stroke slash high cholesterol ulcers diabetes irritable bowel syndrome some cancers obesity substance misuse then again okay. and obviously there's not much listing off that in terms of serious illnesses so the long-term chronic stress can lead to depression so what is depression and we're going to look at this at a baseline level now and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail on the types then again so depression is a common mental disorder characterized by the persistent sadness and a loss of interest in activities that you normally enjoy a company accompanied by an inability to carry out daily activities for at least two weeks so again they i would often say a criticism or a limitation of this would be these arbitrary timelines or things they throw on it two weeks you know it, it doesn't always take that long to feel or experience that you're in a bout of depression or a mood swing uh, or a lower mood capacity um i would like to see it as a much more ecological approach where we hone in that each organism has different feelings and sets feelings against these emotions or thoughts so you know again the cancer culture um the cancel culture the car culture the three c's in these cultures have all led to the unawareness of these things and the unawareness to be able to identify them so people have chronic illness and cancer due to stress as well um clinical papers um released in the last couple of years have kind of identified that so it's vital to distinguish between clinical depression and normal sadness okay it's the intensity so it impairs your social and occupational functioning so your day-to-day -day activities the absence of care so no cause or a disproportionate response to a trigger quality then it's different from normal sadness so look we all get the ups and downs of, of, of everyday life that we have associative features so clusters of signs and symptoms all hitting at once not sleeping not eating you know not interacting with friends these are all signs and symptoms of that history then past episodes has depression arrived previously and um, is it hereditary is it in your family because there's definitely research to tell us that there's part of that signs and symptoms then of depression we've got our thoughts um, and our thoughts are powerful we can be self-critical it can impair our memory again our memory will take um a lot of different uh features we you know you could historically look at the multi-star model or the working memory model of battle a and hitch and come across with a nice intellectual um argument around memory how does it work short term long term uh phonological loop um all of these different things that are associated with memory and what we would come with is that memory needs concentration and all, memory also needs attention so in order for us to take memory on board we first we first must look at the concept of what attention is and how attention works or affects us indecisiveness confusion with things thoughts of death and suicide tends to be high our emotions then which are closely linked to our thoughts and again anybody looking for further research in this or anything based off this a really important one that would have appeared in social psychology is the james and lang theory so william james and then the lang theory as well that's associated with that so we have sadness anxiety guilt anger mood swings irritability this is something that we see with coaches quite often this is something that we see um, with people quite often where we allow our emotions the thoughts the actions that take place during our day to come into coaching coaching sessions we see irritability we see anger we see mood swings sometimes we see athletes with anxiety or guilt around things our emotions generally lead to our behavior so we can withdraw from others we neglect the responsibilities then changes in personal appearance start to occur not always not always you know people can can look fantastic and still be um suffering with depression 
and then there can be the physical signs then again it's chronic fatigue is not like oh, i feel tired because it was up till 5 a.m playing the xbox or whatever it may be chronic fatigue is somebody associative and being understanding of their body and the energy levels and it's a real thing there again and chronic fatigue is closely linked to porn out within sport exercise and performance psychology lack of energy sleeping too much or too little is a telltale sign then again and weight gain or weight loss loss of motivation uh, can be to general life uh, of course us from a sporting academic discipline will look at loss of motivation of cul cultural aspects as well um maybe issues about not going to the gym or whatever it is and then people can turn to substance abuse and as we said previously uh, the danger of substance abuse then in terms of you know mood alteration um, and denial or repression of our true thoughts and feelings <clears throat> it's a dangerous place to be at because it can lead to obviously uh, higher levels of addiction then again so some of the signs and symptoms you would be expecting to have at least two or three of them core symptoms that we spoke of all day every day for at least two weeks so core symptoms low mood fatigue or lack of energy lack of interest or enjoyment in life so plus other three symptoms the diagnosis may be mild moderate or severe depending on the number and intensity of symptoms so you will see this as well most undergraduates would not be able to perform um much research based on um mental health because they aren't qualified to deliver a uh, diagnostic um materials now you could you know once you're not trying to diagnose people you may ask general or try to get inferences around something like that like you know if you're using different metrics so depression and sport mental health awareness then we're going to take a little look at the stigma within mental health so uh, this is from the green ribbon foundation and they say that some of these words perpetuate the idea or the yields around mental health and mental well-being crackers psycho weirdo insane another again you know uh national governing body um you know a national governing body tutor um one said you know we were speaking to the this this guy a bit of a weirdo you know um and a, a colleague a friend of mine said you know define what a weirdo is and actually people in these positions shouldn't be referring to people suffering with mental health or any issues around mental health as a weirdo or mental or another etc it further perpetuates the stigma and when we perpetuate the stigma then it makes it more difficult for people to come out and speak about how they genuinely feel the prevalence of depression then one in every four adults suffers with a mental health issue in the usa so the american psychological association in 2018 have come in and given us this information um and again <clears throat> the, the the we would like to think that it's different here but actually one in three adults are suffering with a mental health issue in ireland then so 95 percent of irish people agree that talking to a friend or family member is helpful for looking after your mental health again we're going to look at the different concepts of our social support networks and how they affect us um or how they can help but also how they can hinder us then again so here's some of the myths around mental health so people with mental health conditions never recover recovery is 100 percent possible with the right treatments and social support people with mental health conditions are violent and unpredictable this myth is uh, this myth is built up over a period of time developed and portrayed by the media creating ne negative stereotypes of people with mental health conditions and none other than the bipolar um depression where they're portrayed as being happy and you know erratically sad uh you know constantly up and down like that uh, so myths of, of mental health people think depression looks like this when in fact we've seen it with some really big celebrities so again people who would um listen to the high performance podcast uh we'll probably have listened to stephen hendry's uh most recent one with them and stephen hendry uh was obviously a really successful snooker player uh seven world titles in snooker but at the start of 2000 began to suffer with extreme somatic anxiety this was perceived to be an isolated issue for the world champion shortly after winning seven world titles stress and anxiety would have diminished with familiarity in these performance situations he tried to explain it stating of course it's psychological when you hold a cue you have to strike the ball uh, 
you have to strike through it and allow it to accelerate but if you're holding it too tight it will act as a de-accelerator especially with sweaty palms over a period of time you began overthinking everything situate every situation and life became worse and worse so a major construct within psychology paralysis by analysis so when we overthink things when we over um when we put energy too much energy in something um or we spend too much time on something when we're prepared for it we can kind of para you know paralyze ourselves by analysis and as one of my students pointed out uh, paralysis by analysis occurs when we're trying to pick a new show or program on tv when there's a selection of them so anxiety meant that was always switching on and couldn't relax when playing or at home in his book henry details the way in which his manager ian doyle controlled him doyle even made henry break up with his girlfriend mandy because he believed the young scott should be consumed by snooker so again eventually after battling the heart he sought medical attempt to recover from these serious bouts of depression so depression isn't just for males um the older cohort of students listening to this are people person you know player coach athlete um depression isn't just for males so what we tend to see is there was a really you know famous tennis player in the 90s called jennifer cabriati and um, i would have watched a good bit of her play fantastic athletes uh, really strong and um, particularly good serve as well it was predicted to become one of the greatest female tennis players of her era in 1994 she admitted that she'd contemplated suicide um due to the tennis borne out and issues over her appearance in 2010 she required treatment for a drug overdose and she now gives mental health talks to schools and tennis players all over the us really nice story to come out of with her being so close um with suicide and being um you know suffering for so long but what a beautiful story to see she's come out the other side and not only come out the other side but you know can really believe in the power of altruism that she's helping others um andre iniesta one of if not one of the greatest players of his generation spanish and barcelona midfield player and um, spoke about this problem um saying i remember that when we came back from the pre-season and one afternoon i was at home and i felt really bad i called dr bruna and told him we need to do something or i don't know what's going to happen i was not myself and at the same the same afternoon we went to training and i said to him i need help i need something i need something because otherwise i won't get out of this slump i wanted to get to the night time so that i could take a pill and sleep so you know what we've got this construct we've got this belief we've got this attitude or bias towards believing that athletes and elite athletes and elite players are impervious to mental health issues or problems and and the reality what we've seen with both steve and jennifer and andreas here is that there's a strong correlation between you know elite sport and then depression as well okay so what can you do to help you can educate yourself on mental health conditions and the recovery process you can recognize the contribution of people with mental health conditions challenge the, the, the stigma and discrimination when you hear or see it i like to believe i do that and i told you the story earlier of the, the national government body where i chimed in with that as well uh, consider the language you use and how a simple change in language you will use will show your openness and empathy to people especially kids to try break the stigma by bringing up mental health in day-to-day -day conversations so the solution then we look at you know different things and i would say you have to keep an open concept and open mind with this we have the push and pull psychiatry psychology medicinal versus use of maybe trauma-informed approach uses of maybe counseling or therapy and therein the solution may lie but one of the things that we did find in a really interesting piece with dr mark tarampolsky the exercise cure um in time magazine and obviously you know what's making it into time magazine um it, it would have to have a weight of scientific endeavor endeavor behind it so it told us that benefits of exercise include improved social interaction attention decision making physical growth and it reduces the risk of depression reduces anxiety improves our sleep increases independence increases self-confidence and it reduces our stress also so why should students consider exercising well the zero hour experiment so again look it up there's a nice little research paper on this as well in the naperville uh, in chicago naperville central high the objective of the zero hour 
is to determine whether working out before school gives kids a boost in reading ability and in the rest of their subjects. A school teacher named Neil Duncan conducted research and turned the 19,000 students in Naperville District 203 into the fittest in the nation and also some of the smartest. One hour of physical activity per school day. The name of the class refers to its scheduled time before the first class, so therefore not the first hour, zero hour. Statistical, uh, the statistical re the, the research has shown that students who signed up for the zero hour experiment demonstrate that students do 17% better on exam examination, both theory based and practical examinations. They have more energy throughout the day. So of course, self reported scale there. Their grades increased by uh, students in a wide variety of other academic tests and subjects. So they would have ran um, correlates, inferentials, descriptive statistics, um, through SPSS and found that there was a, obviously a significant relationship between these. Also the absenteeism decreased by 33% after the intervention. So again, more students you know, went to school and were able to go to school without being ill or feeling ill. Students stated they could focus more during the day for the school subjects. So again, have a read through them ones. So specific benefits of exercise for mental health. So going a little bit deeper into it then, it has a tranquilizing effect. So better resting heart rate, um, circulation, endorphins, thermoregulation as well, improved mood. So chemical balance, serotonin, dopamine, um, they're big parts of it then again. So you would have to be able to, to look at that. Um, these are constructs that you have to be aware uh, aware of if, if that's an area that you're aware of in terms of the, the overall underlying principles. Um, your circulation is a, a key component of when we speak about our heart rate then again. So just be cognizant of that, you know, and um, be aware that there are elements. Um, so what I would say there is just kind of look back on it, be aware of it then again, okay? So improved mood, chemical balance. So yeah, for um, for me, I would be of the approach there that um, the whole thing with serotonin and chemical imbalance has kind of been debunked. You still have staunch believers that that's what's happening within the brain physiology and the chemistry of the brain. We do know the rewarding system of, of dopamine in terms of ke chemicals, uh, but dopamine is also a strong correlate with you know um, the reward system for addiction. So we build up the release of dopamine um, across into the ventral tegmental area, um, and that leads to addiction to a number of different biological components. Feel good factor increased endorphins, as we said, and we can add in our endocannabinoids for that as well in terms of the opiate receptors. Um, more effective for decision making, obviously. We can cope with stress then, so it helps with adrenaline activity, steroids reserves naturally then again. So when we have the ability to do that, when we have the constructs to be able to deal with that, we will have natural adrenaline that's released into our system but it's also about being able to look at approach and take note of these um pure adrenaline bursts that we get where you can feel it across our body then again so physical release expanding muscular tension sometimes we have muscular tension built up through stress mental focus distraction from other thoughts a sense of mastery so we've got association and disassociation when we speak of concentration for elite athletes or not athletes in general excuse me structure for your day routine vitally important as we said before we are mammals we are creatures of habit so when we're out of uh, routine or habit we can be a little bit off then again reduced isolation then opportunity to socialize promotes inclusion interaction with others so that allows and it certainly allays for that so opportunity to socialize promotes inclusion and interaction with others then again so you've got to be aware and you've got to have the um the correlates that go with that so why do people socially interact in most cases it's too socialized to feel better to have that sense of inclusion that you're part of something so Brain derived neurotropic factor is something that, you know, I would say in research terms, it's really a, yeah, it's a really strong correlate towards 
um, the neuro neurological factors that we now see within psychology. So brain-derived neurotropic is a protein base that regulates uh, crucial functions of the central nervous system, such as neurogenesis, the growth and development of nervous tissue, neuroprotection, the preservation of neural structures that we have within the brain cavity and the spinal uh, column, Neuro regeneration includes generation of new neurons, myelin and then or synapse, so myelin sheets then closely aligned with Schwann cells in most cases, or and the use of the nodes of RAMV air. And then we have cell uh, cell survival then again. So brain derived neurotropic factor improves the function of neurons, encourages their growth and strengthens and protects them against the neural process of cell death. Atrophy is natural for us, including with brain cells. So the, the cells will die off naturally. Brain derived neurotropic factor is a crucial biological link between thought, emotions and movement. So we will take a closer look at some of the specifics now of what you will have come across in the past or will closely come across as you go forward in the future of exercise and depression and maybe a little bit of a closer look in terms of some um case studies there as well okay so we'll classify classify what mental health and mental illness is we're going to be able to look at a mental disorder as well and these things tend to be interchangeably used across pop uh, psychology um, mainstream media when they have different functions as you can see so mental health is a state of successful performance of function and results in productivity uh, productive activities fulfilling relationships with other people and the ability to adapt to change and cope with adversity now wow what a massively long definition that is okay we take that we break that down we look at the components therein and what we tend to see what we tend to find is look at the ability to adapt in there it's a very darwin approach it's a very creative approach to what we do as a species we've got to have the ability to adapt not about being strong not about being quick about the ability to adapt mental illness on the other hand refers to collective to all diagnosable mental disorders and we'll continue that now shortly whereas a mental disorder health conditions that are characterized by altered thinking mood or behavior associated with the stress and or impaired functioning so our day-to-day -day functioning is altered our day-to-day -day existence may have distress attached to it okay now mental health problems some people may not have signs and symptoms of sufficient intensity or duration duration to meet the crisis. so we look at what we said earlier we go back and examine it we think of the two-week period to two-week period and that is not sufficient so however the symptoms are sufficient enough to potentially warrant active efforts in health promotion prevention and treatment we have the continuum of mental health illness mental health problems and then mental health so at one end of the spectrum we've mental illness then we've our mental health attachment to what's classified as positive but in there we all have mental health problems then again so we would look at the the, the world health organization again depression long lasting recurrent or and recurrent which impairs uh, individuals ability to cope with daily life so depression is defined by sadness feelings of guilt low self-worth tiredness or low appetite okay so again look at them How would you classify them? Physiological, psychological, social, or emotional? That's a challenge. Now, at least one third of individuals are expected to experience at least one bout of depression in their lifetime. Only 30% of people with depression seek help of the professional. So again, a little bit of an older research paper there. Feeling depressed is only part of clinical depression. Clinical depression has a high personal, social, and economic cost so as with everything you know people value money when they should really value time uh, diagnosed depression is more common in females so 5.1 to male 3.6 and again if we were to put our research caps on and look at the uh, validity and reliability of that we would often look at the limitation of maybe males aren't answering honestly because of the uh, social stigma and, and expectations of them to be the alpha male to be the breadwinner etc so on and so forth 
Depression is higher in adulthood, so it's above 7.5 amongst females, age 55 to 74, and 5.5 among males. 322 million uh, living with depression. Southeast Asia and Western Pacific region most affected. So from 2005 to 2015, people with depression has increased by 18.4. Now you would look at this, and again I would say, let's put our research cap on, let's go back to week for when we studied sleep let's start to look at dependent independent variables here has it changed have we had an increase or has it always existed but just the stigma has decreased a little and therefore people are more willing and able to talk about what depression is depression uh, depressed individuals are more likely that more than likely are more likely than others to develop cardiovascular disease and to die of all cancers now research obviously from 1995 would seem like it's preordained but actually this research has told us and led us to the first clinical findings that actually depression will lead to coronary heart disease cardiovascular disease as such um, and then we will die of the different types of cancer that's there major depressive disorders then okay you've got your unipolar major depression you've got your bipolar dysthemia you've got your cyclothemia or cyclothemia uh, and then you've got the diagnostic and statistic manual of mental disorder which i won't say too much about so your major uh, depressive disorder is seen as depressed mood loss of interest or pleasure or, or primary symptoms not driven by physiological causes i.e drugs or medical conditions so um, other symptoms can vary widely episodes last approximately nine months of untreated 80 to 90 percent remit within two years of the first episode 50 percent will reoccur and symptoms cause significant impairment in social work or other important areas your bipolar depression which we have said the media has taken and driven and perpetuated the nature of what bipolar depression is but more to the fact here the research is giving us one or more episodes of mania so they're them uncontrolled bouts or mixed episodes of mania and depression mania can range from pure euphoria slash elation to irritability thoughts are grandiose or delusional so again we're not thinking straight or right and you know we've got different ideals a decreased need for sleep so we tend to cut off that that need for sleep easily distracted with racing thoughts excessive involvement in pleasurable activities that are likely to have painful consequences so unrestrained shopping spree uh, sexual indiscretions so people tend to just be you know uh, it's kind of been noted that there's been you know numerous cases where people have been you know there's been infidelity because of it i guess higher familial prevalence then again so stronger genetic component then uh, for females uh, dysthemia then chronic form of depression fewer than five persistent symptoms duration of approximately two years for adults approximately one year for children increased susceptibility to major depression seldom remit spontaneously and then women twice as likely to be diagnosed as men now again you've got to i keep referring to this research cap that i'm asking you but again why are women twice as likely to be diagnosed well they may be also twice as likely to go to a gp in general uh, the cyclothemia then marked by manic and depressive states but of insufficient intensity and duration to be diagnosed as bipolar or major depressive increased risk of developing bipolar disorder now symptoms that may accompany depression feelings of sadness or elation difficulty concentrating loss of interest in all if not most activities problems with our memory disturbances of our appetite disturbances in sleep patterns and thoughts of suicides lack of energy and then hallucinations uh, the sympathology sympathetic symptomatology uh, symptomatology excuse me can be a mental problem or mental illness can be clinical or non-clinical depending on uh, the severity and duration not all forms of depression reach clinical levels uh, dysphoria then negative or adversive mood so normal levels you'll tend to see that people have high rates of this across the spectrums because you know we would classify it as having these you know life circumstances mild to moderate depression can include difficulty concentrating disturbed sleep changes in appetite fatigue or loss of energy uh, again standard classification criteria 
is the DSM. It's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, which at one stage, no problem I mentioned this, uh, was classifying um, homosexuality as being a mental illness. Um, preposterous, anyway. Okay, so you see these self-report scales then again. Um, this CES um, sample items here, they'll go through rarely some occasionally or most of the time in terms of the days during the week and you can see these series of questions there on the left hand side i'll give you a moment to run through them so you just want to run through them i'll give you a moment to do so okay so probably got a chance to read through the questions there maybe you, you, you will like to answer some of them and see what way it works you can see the scoring down the bottom then gives you a good indication of where or how you're at in relation to these um, studies and obviously the study of diseases epidemiology so that's what it's referring to at the top of your screen again uh, scoring it tells you all about it there um, again if you're watching the recording of this you can go back and look at it and try and score it yourself to see where you are or what you're at um, uh, you know look if you're concerned or worried at all you know give your, your GP a call and, and you know speak to them about that then again this is in no way an administration uh, in no way am I administering uh, this is a, a, a something that I'm telling you is to use clinically, nor should I use it clinically. Um, only people in in qualified qualified positions, i.e., G, G, um, GPs, uh, clinical based psychologists or psychiatrists. Okay. So some of the causes they're not fully understood. I said it to you earlier as a class as a coach as a parent as a, per, a person uh, physiological and psychological factors interact in response to some stressful event some research has focused on biological factors such as neurotransmitter deficiencies but this is an insufficient explanation individual variation in stress responses hereditary coping skills experience gender environment social support influence degree to which the dep depression is manifest manifests itself excuse me so costs uh, these are obviously you know research figures coming from the US but, but it's, it's probably because these figures can can closely <clears throat> can be found quite easily as such 59 billion per year in 2019 in the US it cost them breakdown of cost 31% spent on direct treatment and rehabilitation 7% on mortality and then 62% for absenteeism and reduction of work and productivity uh, other costs then increased for other diseases decreased quality of life of, for individuals and families the treatment of it then again uh, when depression is treated you can have um, pharmacotherapy then or psychotherapy non-compliance is frequent then again some people just don't won't not interested can be expensive and have unwanted side effects then again particularly when we look at the medicinal stuff um loads of cl clinical trials being illustrated there in terms of uh, antidepressants and you know whether they work or how long they work and then our level of homeostasis in terms of becoming desensitized to them um and how your body just ends up absorbing them in the end and you know a lot of time you'll see people with anxiety disorders who might start off with half a xanax and they could build up to three or four xanax um you know a tablet used as a sedative uh, with anxiety and in reference to that you will often see this you know somebody who hasn't taken one of them in the past half of one would probably put you asleep you know uh, for want of a better example uh, some people take up to three or four of them at a time as well then once they become uh, desensitized to them so common treatment for depression sometimes there's the self-help so you might read a cbt book you might do a bit of mindfulness um, meditation relaxation uh, exercises phenomenal breathing techniques um talk and therapy cbt cognitive behavioral therapy um REBT, rational emotive behavioral therapy, uh, counseling as well, and then medication then is the the one that you'd probably do last. Um, but of course, we're in a situation where doctors 
first part of call is preservation of life so if somebody's depressed there's always that fear or worry around suicidality so doctors in most cases probably would prescribe antidepressants you could end up on um you know something like valium as such that that that, that you could end up being on that for the rest of your life you know these kind of things um they have high high levels of addiction so you could be highly addicted to a legal drug research on preventative effects of exercise so research shows a connection between growing lack of physical activity um, and increase in prevalence of mental health problems a consistent finding indicates that uh, le least active individuals have the greatest incident incidence of mental health problems regular physical activity can be useful in preventing mental health disorders and reducing the risk of occurrence this lack of cardiovascular fitness puts a depressed person at risk of a heart attack it also seems that the depression and exercise influence each other a sedentary lifestyle increases the risk of depression and depression increases the likelihood of sedentary lifestyles uh, some of the findings then in terms of non-clinical depression and um, these obviously examined 80 uh, studies then uh, exercise result in decrease in depression exercise was an effective as sometimes more effective than traditional therapies I often think back to uh, an incident um, a learning curve slash incident where um, you, you you've probably all heard of niacin in the past if you haven't look it up so you can get flush or non-flush niacin in tablets form basically um and niacin is heavily um featured in things like um lexapro and other different antidepressants uh, niacin will be a high chemical compound that's found in them and actually with clinical trials you can find high levels of niacin in cashew nuts and in a clinical trial done out of ohio state i think it was um they found that two handfuls of cashew nuts every day um in a, in a trial had the same amount of niacin as an antidepressant medication tablet um, and what they found was that there was an increase in, in, in mood by having the cashew nuts. So there's plenty of organic ways to get things like, you know, the components of niacin. And um, then again, that can be very good in terms of uh, our mood and how we feel with stuff. Some factors moderated exercise treatment effects while others did not. These exercise variables and participant variables. Exercise variable then. So found no difference in various modes of exercise. Okay, so that was obviously a, a while ago as we've said. It appears that as the length of the program increases, the degree of depression reduction also increases. But few studies have examined longer periods of exercise. So maybe a longitudinal study, maybe a 10 year one or a five year one. Exercise intensity was not reported consistently for any comparison to be made. Frequency then, an area that also needs to be examined. Participant variables, so age, decre uh, obviously um, decreased depression for all ages. Uh, gender, the antidepressant effect was similar for both males and females. Initial level then, does initial level of depression have an influence on the degree of depression reduction? Regardless, all participants showed similar decrease in production following the experiment. Exercise variables as uh, moderate and moderating factors the length of the exercise program um, so the length of exercise program is not as important as just doing it uh, Q versus chronic so smaller bouts versus chronic uh, depression reduction in depression occurred for both single bouts of exercise and longer term projects or programs exercise versus traditional uh, treatments so north in 1990 and then biddle and Muter then in 2001 exercise decreases depression better than not having any treatment exercise is as effective as traditional treatments psychotherapy and some medication exercise with psychotherapy yields the best depression reduce uh, reducing effects exercise is cost effective exercise also increases physical health as an added benefit now research on the treatment again and more studies in a study of hospitalized psychiatry patients patients uh, rated exercise as the most important comprehensive treatment plan 
showed that both the next one showed that both aerobic and non-aerobic exercise results in si significant psychological improvements and then a study in 1997 found that people who trained harder had greater reductions in depression more research then showed that ex uh, exercise tre treatment was ineffective as pharmacology or pharmacotherapy a pharmacotherapy excuse me treatment and combination of drug exercise treatment follow-up studies showed that the exercise group was more likely to be fully or partially recovered Fe the, the final one then by the and martin 1999 found that exercise might reduce the level of medication needed length of time is needed and then perhaps even the need for all for medication at all finally we look at the exercise can be associated with decreased level to a mild to moderate exercise level may be an adjunct to the professional treatment of severe depression so what we see is the emotions and the attentions sadly on my diagram here you can see low you can't really see low mood bottom left right as we move along that road we have situation and personal skills then we have intentions or level of motivation comes into it and then we have the levels of confidence then again so ways to get uh, to get moving facilitators of exercise barriers then improve belief about consequences so give them information around that emotion behavioral regulation social influence plays a major role then again the people around them are they facilitative or are they debilitating mechanisms of change then the anthropological hypothesis uh, again the study of human uh, leads us to certain parts endorphin hypothesis the monomine uh, hypothesis mastery hypothesis and the social interaction hypothesis okay so the anthropological hypothesis then again um martin stein then in 20, uh, 2002 in recent decades technology has progressed to the point where we no longer have to engage in vigorous activity for our survival also in recent decades incidents of depression have increased dramatically we are gen genetically predisposed to be physically active hunter gatherers too early century uh, when manual labor is still predominant only within the last 50 to 70 years such vigorous forms of activity no longer necessary for our survival past 70 uh, 50 to 75 years that depression has increased dramatically a uh, violating our genetic warranty according to jonas greg uh, there in 1989 we, vo we violate our genetic predispos predisposition by being sed sedentary it is the prob it is probable not uh, probably not surprising that we then face a host of health problems okay so what do you think of the anthropological uh, the anthropological uh, hypothesis the study of you know they say man what an irritating phrase the study of you man is the way i like to phrase it anyway so it encapsulates both gender endorphin hypothesis during stress exercise the body produces endorphins so natural painkillers increasing endorphins may reduce depression thus if endorphins are released during exercise and exercise makes us feel better slash less depressed then it increases the endorphins could be the reason why more research is needed before firm conclusions can be reached the monomine hypothesis effects of exercise on depression are due to all their brain neurotransmitters so serotonin um as we said before it was something for a long period of time and i was brought up on the education and um, when i was in college initially we were told that you know um, depression was all because of a chemical balance and it was all in our head etc so on and so forth um norepinephrine again a type of adrenaline that's released into the system and epinephrine then again and dopamine these are all neurotransmitters the ones that you're probably more aware of and cognizant is serotonin and dopamine and i've spoke about dopamine a couple of times but you'll be aware of the uh, regulatory issue of what it does because it's part of the reward system and only this evening have we looked and spoke and for students who haven't done it recently will we refer back to the concept of stimulus and response and the release of dopamine in the system when we do achieve this these neurotransmitters have all been implicated in regulation of emotion enhancing or inhibiting emotion exercise increases the rate of neurotransmitter production and most research has been conducted on animals results remain to be seen but seems positive again you know you 
you can study ethology you can go back to the 50s you can try to understand organisms in their natural habitat you can go back and you can come across authors like um conrad lorenz you can go back and find uh, von frisk and you can find counterparts like tim bergen um, and these three uh, people who are often cited as the fathers of ethology they, they want or they need to study uh, species in their natural habitat and again it would be a more reliable a more valid variable to study these uh, species in their natural environment okay hold it for a moment conrad lorenz we probably may have seen a bit a really famous uh, photo of him walking with ducks where they these baby uh, ducks hatched um the little ducklings and he was the first uh person slash species that they seen and they had attachment to him and there's this really famous photo of them all following following him along Okay, that's brilliant and everything else. Really difficult to like Conrad Lorenz. He was a neo-Nazi, or he, excuse me, he was a Nazi. He was not a neo-Nazi, excuse me. He was a Nazi and he was a war criminal um, as well. So uh, really difficult to like uh, Conrad Lorenz, whereas the likes of Von Frisk and Tim Bergen, um, done really cool research and in fact uh tim bergen's research is really really cool he done research with these gall boards so these large boards um and he was studying them in the natural habitat and what he found was um once eggs were hatched so these these would have relatively large enough eggs but once these eggs were hatched and they had these sprinklets on them and um, what we'd kind of i suppose we'd call them spots or freckles or whatever it would be on the top of the eggshells uh where the the, the 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 baby birds were born from or they hatched from excuse me um they'd have these you know dots and you know freckles whatever we call them on top of it um and the mother after the 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 little um, babies had hatched would then start to reconstruct the eggshell um, back together so that it would look more like a dark color from the overlay because other predators from above um, would have a strong capacity to see the white of the eggshell the lysosomes that we're aware of we call them white uh, white blood cells excuse me um and this is a really fascinating insight into how you know um when we speak of uh, etology when we study things in the natural habitat we get to understand them greater but we of course we we have uh you know iphones and we've got laptops and we've got central heating and we think we're so evolved and everything else but actually when we look at some of these creatures in the the animal kingdom they're as, as evolved as we are we just think that we are inverted commas more involved in fact it's a story i tell quite often about limpets who may sit on a rock for you know hundreds and hundreds of years but they're as evolved as we are they probably don't do anything else except they step on or stay on the rock and be part of the algae and the function around that but in fact they're as evolved as we are and and the work of uh tinbergen and and von frisk in terms of these uh, research capacities and natural research capacities are fascinating and um, again so exercise then increases the rate of neurotransmitter production so the hormones they fire across that synaptic cleft the synaptic cleft of course as you're probably aware not much of a gap in between it um, and they fire across some are dissolved and then others are taken back up through reuptake and some of you may or may not have heard of uh, these SRRIs so serotonin, uh, serotonin reuptake um, so again uh, these neurotransmitters play a major role in terms of, 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 of how we perform our capacities uh other ones then we've got the mastery hypothesis so again just accomplishing things and getting better through you know self-worth self-completion gratitude etc and then the social interactional hypo uh, interaction hypothesis which gives us a good insight into um how we can get better in, in social grouping and group therapy has become hugely popular um 
for want of a better phrase, uh, the reasons why is is not altogether great, not altogether a great indication on us as a species or a society in the sense that maybe the group therapy takes place because people can't afford to go and see a psychologist um, on a one-to-one -one basis because of the cost. So more of an indictment on us than anything else then again. Practical recommendations, exercise done on a regular basis can be useful in treating depression as well as in protecting against it. Um, research consistently shows that 30 minutes of aerobic exercise three times a week will significantly reduce depression. The types of exercise doesn't seem to matter. Again, disclaimer down there, we'll talk about the aerobic stuff again in due time. Okay, and that's us in terms of our research for depression and anxiety. So I hope you've enjoyed this and it's been um, informational for you that you've taken anything from it, uh, that you've taken a lot of um, take home messages from it then again. So when we look at it, we looked at the components of stress, we've looked at the components of anxiety, and we've also gone into the intricacies of what depression is. We've looked at it from a uh, pharmacotherapy site we've looked at it from the symptomatology site we've looked at it from all different angles and what we find is that we've got different constructs that medicinal stuff can work for some people uh, whether they be excitatory or inhibitory types of uh, drugs and then we've also found lots of material in terms of why exercise is so beneficial to us as a species um, particularly when we look at inactivity what occurs to us as a species when we are inactive so we really are made to move and we are constantly reaffirming that motivation and mover is the key